In this lesson, we will take equations that are not quadratic equations and write them in quadratic form. Then we may solve them using our quadratic methods. I'd like to begin by reviewing the definition of a quadratic equation in the variable x. An equation that can be written in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, where a, b, and c are real numbers and a does not equal to zero, is said to be a quadratic equation in the variable x. If a equals zero, then this first term would be zero times x squared, which would equal to zero, which would mean that we would not have an x squared term. We would not have the quadratic term. We know that for an equation to be a quadratic equation, it must have the x squared term. It may also have the bx or linear term and a constant term. I'd like for us to look at an equation that is not a quadratic equation and discuss how to convert it to quadratic form. The equation x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 4 equals 0 is not a quadratic equation, is it? It's got the x to the fourth power term. We could rewrite this as an equivalent equation. We may write the x to the fourth as x squared squared. We know that when we have x squared squared, since we're taking the power of a power, that we multiply exponents and two times two would result in x to the fourth. And of course, for this second term, I've simply put the x squared in parentheses, which we know that minus five and then the parentheses in, with the x squared inside of them simply means minus five x squared. And then of course we have the constant and then we have the equals zero. Now suppose that we replaced x squared with w. Suppose we let w equal x squared and substituted for x squared the w. What would this equation look like? Well, in place of this x squared, we would have the w, and then of course it would be squared, wouldn't it? minus the 5, and then we would replace this x squared with w, so we'd have minus 5w, and then of course we would have the plus 4 equals 0. This new equation is a quadratic equation in the variable w. Notice what we do, did. We took this original equation that was not quadratic, and by substitution, converted it to quadratic form. An equation that can be converted to quadratic form is called an equation in quadratic form. Any equation that can be converted to the form aw squared plus bw plus c equals zero, where a, b, and c are real numbers and a does not equal to zero, is called an equation in quadratic form. Notice again, a does not equal to zero guarantees that we have that square term or that quadratic term. It is important as we work through this lesson that we learn to recognize which equations are equations in quadratic form. We must know which equations can be converted to quadratic form. Now, let's look at the first problem, and I think you'll recognize this. That's the first example, isn't it? We are to solve 
We know that when we solve, we're looking for the value of x that we can replace each x with and compute the left side so that in this case, the result will equal to zero. Now, how do I recognize that this is an equation in quadratic form? Well, notice that to begin with, I have three terms on the left, I have a constant, and I have zero on the right. For my terms on the left, the second term, let's look at the variable part. It's x squared, isn't it? What if I square x squared? What do I get? Well, of course, we discussed this, I get x to the fourth. When I have an equation set equal to zero with three terms on the left, I look at the variable part of the middle term and see if, when I square it, I get the variable part of the first term. This tells me whether or not the equation is an equation in quadratic form. Now, let's rewrite this. We know that x to the fourth is x squared squared minus, we'll have five times, and we'll write our x squared in parentheses, plus four equals zero. Now let's write what w equals. It's very important each time that we write down our substitution variable. W is my substitution variable, and I'm going to substitute W in place of the x squared. So let's rewrite this equation. We will have W taking the place of x squared, so we'll have W squared minus 5 times w plus 4 equals 0. This resulting equation is quadratic. It is written in standard form, meaning that we have the quadratic term, then the linear term, then the constant equal to 0. Since it is quadratic, we will try to factor it. We'll use w times w for the w squared. On the positive 4, let's use minus 1, minus 4. Let's check it. W times W is W squared. We'll get minus 4W for an outside product, minus 1W for an, for an inside product. When we add minus 4W and minus 1W, we get minus 5W. And last, negative 1 times negative 4 gives us positive 4. We may now use our zero product principle that says if I have one factor times another factor equal to zero, that either the w minus one equals zero or the w minus four equals zero. Solving the equations. First, we'll add 1 to both sides. We get W equals 1. Next, we'll add 4 to both sides. We get W equals 4. Are we finished? No, we're not finished, are we? This is one of the mistakes that my students often make. They stop here. Now, what have we really found at this point? We have found the solutions for this equation. W squared minus 5W plus 4 equals 0. We need the solutions for the original equation, don't we? So, how do we find the solutions for the original equation? We go right back to this w equals x squared, which is why I insisted that we write it. We know that w equals x squared, and we have also found that w equals 1 and w equals 4. Let's write. Well, if w equals x squared and w equals 1, doesn't that mean that x squared must equal to 1? Doesn't that mean that x squared must equal to 4? These, w equals x squared, w equals 4, 
then this x squared must equal to 4 and this x squared must equal to 1. Now we may solve these new equations for x and we will have the solutions for our original equation. Since I have the quadratic term and the constant term, I think I'll extract roots here. Remember my extraction of roots theorem says that I will get x on the left and plus or minus the square root of 1 on the right, which of course is plus or minus 1. And for my second equation, when I use my extraction of roots theorem, I get x on the left and plus or minus the square root of 4, which is plus or minus 2. So my solutions to my original equation would be plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2. I really need to take all four of these solutions. Remember, this represents the four solutions, positive 1, negative 1, positive 2, negative 2, and check them in this original equation. I will leave this check for you. I will, however, check some of the problems during this lesson. Now let's look at problem number two. I think you'll find it's very similar to problem number one. We have an equation to solve. It is not quadratic. Is it in quadratic form? Well, remember that what we do is we take the variable of the middle term, x squared, square it, and of course we know that from problem number one that that's equal to x to the fourth the variable part of the first term. So yes, it's in quadratic form. First, let's rewrite it. Let's write it as 2, and then in place of the x to the fourth, let's write x squared squared plus 5, and let's use parentheses for our x squared minus 3 equals 0. Now, let's substitute for x squared. Let's let w equal x squared. So, we'll have 2. We'll replace this x squared with w. So, we'll have w squared plus 5 times. We'll replace this x squared with w minus 3 equals 0. Now, we have a quadratic equation in the variable w. Since it's in standard form, let's factor. Let's use 2w times w. And I think we want to use 3 and 1, and we want to use opposite signs. I think the 3 needs to be positive and the 1 needs to be negative. Now, let's use our zero product theorem that says that one of these factors must equal to zero. And now let's solve for w. In the first equation, let's add one to both sides. We get 2w equals one. Let's divide both sides by two. So our solution for W would be W equals 1 half. For this second equation, let's subtract 3 from both sides. We get W equals negative 3. Now do we stop here? No, we don't. 1 half and negative 3 are solutions for this quadratic equation in the variable w. We want to find the x's that make this equation a true statement. So what we have to do is go up to our relationship between w and x squared. We know w equals x squared. And we know that w equals 1 half. So that means that x squared must equal 1 half, and let's write that. x squared equals 1 half 
and we know W equals X squared and W equals negative 3, so that must mean that X squared equals negative 3. So with our W solutions and our relationship between W and X, we get two equations. These two equations are quadratic in the variable X. I think since we have the quadratic term in a constant, maybe the quickest way to solve these would be to extract roots, but certainly you may solve these using any method that you know of for solving quadratic equations. When we use our extraction of roots property, it says that on the left when we extract roots we get x, and on the right it says that we get plus or minus the square root of one half. Now we don't want to leave it in that form, do we? Let's think of this square root of one half as the square root of one divided by the square root of two. Let's rationalize, let's multiply by the square root of two over the square root of two, and we'll get plus or minus. The square root of one times the square root of two gives us the square root of two, and the square root of two times the square root of two will give us the square root of four, which we know is two. So two of our solutions, for our original equation would be plus the square root of 2 over 2 and minus the square root of 2 over 2. Now let's solve this second equation. When we extract roots, we know that the extraction of roots property tells us that the solution x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 3. And of course we don't leave that negative under the radical. That would be plus or minus i times the square root of 3. So our solutions for this equation would be plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2 and plus or minus i times the square root of 3. Now, I want to check one of these solutions just because I'm afraid you might have some difficulty checking in the original. Um, I think uh, that maybe the one I'll check will be minus the square root of 2 over 2. So let's see that that checks. So I want to replace each x with minus the square root of 2 over 2, so we'll have 2, we'll have minus the square root of 2 over 2 to the fourth power plus 5 times minus the square root of 2 over 2 squared minus 3, does that equal to 0? Well, we need to figure out, we need our Rules of order tell us to square first, raise our exponents first. I've got to raise to the fourth power here. Of course, when I have a negative number raised to an even power, I know that the result is positive. So um, we'll go ahead and put a positive sign. And then I will have the square root of 2 raised to the fourth power over 2 to the fourth. And in the second term, of course, the negative raised to the second power will be positive. I'll have the square root of 2 squared over 2 squared. Does that equal to 0? Remember when we are raising a quotient to a power, we may apply that power to both the numerator and the denominator. Now let's see what we have here. The square root of 2 to the fourth. Well, uh, we know that the square root of 2 to the 4th is equal to the square root of 2 to the 4th uh, with the 4 inside the radical. And so 2 to the 4th is 16, so the square root of 16 is 4. So this is 4, so we've got 2 times 4 over 2 to the 4th, which is 16 plus 5 
The square root of 2 squared, of course, is 2 over 2 squared, which is 4, minus 3. Does that equal to 0? Well, let's see here. Uh, I need to multiply now. The 2 will go into the 16 8 times, won't it? So what I end up with is 4 eighths, which I know reduces to 1 half. 4 goes into 4 once and 4 goes into 8 twice. Plus, I've got this 5 over 1. Let's uh, reduce to 4, so it reduces to 1 half, doesn't it? Minus 3, does this equal to 0? Let's finish this multiplication. We'll have 1 half plus 5 times 1 over 1 times 2 minus 3. 1 half plus 5 halves is 6 halves. So we have 6 halves minus 3. Does that equal to 0? Well, what's 6 halves? It's 3, isn't it? So sure enough, 3 minus 3 is 0. So um, minus the square root of 2 over 2 does check. I was afraid that check might be difficult for you, and I thought some of you would benefit from seeing it. Uh, let us remember, though, let's go back to our solutions. Our solutions for this equation would be plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2 and plus or minus i times the square root of 3, and I will leave the check for the other solutions in this problem to you. Let's work problem number three now. We have 4x subtract the square root of x minus 3 equals 0. Of course, we recognize this as a radical equation, and we know that we could use our method for solving ra radical equations by isolating the radical to solve this. But let's see if this also is an equation in quadratic form. To determine if it is, Remember, we look at the variable part in this second term. We take it, we square it, and see if we get the variable part in the first term. Well, the square root of x squared is x. So sure enough, we get the variable part of the first term. So that tells us that since we have 4x minus the square root of x minus 3 equals 0, and this variable part can be squared to get this variable part, that this is an equation in quadratic form. Let's rewrite it. We'll say 4, and let's write this x, which we know is the square root of x squared, minus, and for this square root of x, let's just put that in parentheses, subtract 3 equals 0. I like to rewrite this equation because I think it emphasizes the point that the variable part of this first term, which is the square root of x, is squared. And then in the second term, we have that same variable, the square root of x, to the first power. That's why we call it an equation in quadratic form. Now let's write our substitution. w will equal the square root of x. Remember that w equals this variable part in this second term. Let's replace the square root of x with w. In the first term, we'll have 4, and then we'll have w squared minus w minus 3 equals 0. We now have a quadratic equation in the variable w. Let's factor. Let's write 3 and 1, and I believe that 1 needs to be negative and that 3 needs to be positive. All right, let's use our zero product theorem and set each factor equal to zero. Let's solve for w in each equation. Let's subtract 3 here. Let's divide by 4. Let's add 1 here. Now, we have 2 
solutions here. We can tell from these equivalent equations that w equals negative 3 fourths and w equals 1. Of course, we want to know what x equals, so we have to go back to our substitution equation and let's relate our w solutions to x. If we know w equals the square root of x and w equals negative 3 fourths, then we know that the square root of x equals negative 3 fourths. Basically, what we're doing is we're replacing this w with what it's equal to, the square root of x. And likewise, we know that the square root of x equals 1. Now, I want us to uh, focus on these two equations. These are the two equations that we get when we relate our w solutions to what w is equal to in terms of x. Next, we need to solve these two equations, and the solutions that we get for these two equations uh, should be solutions for our original equation. But look what happens here. We have the square root of x equals negative 3 fourths. Is there a number that we can take the square root of and get negative 3 fourths? There is not, is there? So there will be no solution for this first equation. Now some of you will recognize that and some of you will not. Some of you will continue to try to solve. Well, can we continue to try to solve this equation? Well, this is a radical equation. We know when we solve a radical equation, we isolate the radical, the radical's isolated, and then what do we do? We square both sides, don't we? So let's square both sides. And what do we get? Well, the square root of x squared is x, and on the other side, negative 3 4 squared, of course, the negative squared gives us a positive, and when we square the 3 4 we get 9 sixteenths. So our, our equivalent equation here is x equals 9 sixteenths. So our solution for this equation that we got when we square both sides is 9 sixteenths. Now do you remember what can happen when we square both sides of an equation? Any time that we square both sides of an equation, we can introduce extraneous solutions. This is a solution for this equation, but is it a solution for the original equation? Any time we square both sides, we have to check the answer that we got from squaring both sides in the equation that we had before we squared both sides to see if indeed it is a solution of the equation we had before we squared both sides. So let's do that. Let's check 9 sixteenths up here. That would be the square root of 9 sixteenths. Does that equal to negative 3 fourths? Well, what is the square root of 9 sixteenths? It's positive 3 fourths, isn't it? Positive 3 fourths does not equal to negative 3 fourths. So this solution does not check in this equation that we had before we squared both sides. This solution is extraneous for this equation right here. So for this first equation, we do not get an x value that is a solution for our original equation. Uh, for this square root of x equals 1, well, we will solve this. It's a radical equation. The radical is isolated, so we will square both sides. The square root of x squared is x, and of course 1 squared is 1 we get the equivalent equation x equals 1, so we know that the solution for this equation when we square both sides is 1. The question is, is 1 a solution for the equation we had before we squared both sides? So we've got to go back and check to see if 1 is extraneous, and let's check it. We'll have the square root of 1, does that equal to 1? And sure enough, the square root of 1 does equal to 1. So 1 is the only solution that we get 
that is a solution for this equation. Let's write that in solution set notation and I will leave the check of the solution one to you. Now looking at problem number four, I want you to notice the variable parts here. I have x minus four squared, and x minus 4 is understood to be to the first power. This is already written with a variable squared in the first term and a variable expression to the first power in the middle term. Now actually to solve this one thing I could do would be to square out this binomial, distribute this negative 4, and combine like terms on this left side and I would have a quadratic equation and I could just solve that quadratic equation. But let's use substitution here. We do not need to rewrite this equation to express the variable squared in the first term and the variable to the first power in the second term because it's already in that form. We can just start right off by writing what W should represent, and w in this case will equal to the variable part of this middle term, which is x minus 4. So now let's replace this x minus 4 in this first term with w. We get w squared, subtract 4 times, let's replace this x minus 4 with w, minus 5 equals 0. We have a quadratic equation in the variable w, Let's factor. Let's use a negative 5 and a positive 1. Let's use our zero product theorem and set each factor equal to 0. And let's solve each of these equations. We'll subtract 1 from both sides of the first equation. We'll add 5 to both sides of the second equation. Now, notice we have W values here. These are solutions for this equation. To get the solutions for this original equation, we have to relate these W solutions to our x, we know that w equals x minus 4 and w equals negative 1. So that means replacing this w with the x minus 4, that x minus 4 equals negative 1 and x minus 4 equals 5. Let's add 4 to both sides. of this equation, we get x equals 3, and let's add 4 to both sides of this equation, we get x equals 9. So the solutions for our problem number 4 would be 3 and 9, and I will leave the check to you. Now let's look at problem number five. Is this equation a, an equation in quadratic form? Well, let's analyze the variable part of this second term. We'll have x to the negative one power. If we square it, what do we get? We get x to the power of a power tells us to multiply exponents. Negative one times two is negative two. Is this the variable part of this first term? The answer is yes. This would be an equation in quadratic form. I do want to rewrite it. I want to write that x to the negative second power as what I know it's equal to x to the negative first squared minus 7 and then let's write x to the negative first in parentheses plus 2 equals 0. And of course this shows us 
that we have this variable x to the negative first is to the second power in the first term and the first power is understood in that middle term. Let's write our substitution. W equals x to the negative first power. Let's substitute. We'll have 3 times w squared minus 7 times w plus 2 equals 0. Let's factor. We'll need to use minus 2 times minus 1, want we to get a positive 2, and to get the correct middle term. Let's set each factor equal to 0. Let's solve each equation. Let's add 1 to both sides. Let's divide by 3. Let's add 2 to both sides. Let's write our solutions for this quadratic equation in W. We have W equals 1 third and W equals 2. Now let's go back to our equation equation that relates W and X. Let's relate our W solutions to our X. We know that X to the negative 1 will equal 1 third and X to the negative 1 will equal 2. Replacing both of these W's with what it's equal to in terms of X. Now, let's look at these equations. We need to solve these two equations, right? So that's the first thing we need to do. So the question is, how do we do that? Well, first let's think what does x to the minus 1 power equal? Do you remember what it equals? It equals the reciprocal of x, doesn't it? If we want to rewrite x to the negative first power as an expression with only positive exponents, what happens to the x to the negative 1? We will have 1 in the numerator, and we will have x in the denominator raised to the positive 1 power. By definition, x to the negative 1 equals 1 over x. So another way to write this equation would be 1 over x equals 1 over 3. Now, we need to solve for x. Do you remember what we call an equation that has x in the denominator? We call it a fractional equation, don't we? Remember that when we have a fractional equation, we need to get rid of the denominators, and we do that by finding the LCD. Let's write what the LCD is. I have a factor of x and a factor of 3, so my LCD is 3x. Let's multiply both sides of this equation by 3x. We'll have 3x times 1 over x equals 3x times 1 third. On the left, x divided by x is 1. We'll have 3 times 1 is 3. On the right, 3 divided by 3 is 1. x times 1 is x. So we get the solution of this equation that 3 is equal to x. Now, I want us to talk about a couple of things here. Number 1, in the beginning, if we know that x to the minus 1 represents the reciprocal of x, then what we know is that 1 third is the reciprocal of x. So what number is 1 third the reciprocal of? 1 third is the reciprocal of 3, isn't it? So we could have recognized in the beginning that 1 third was the reciprocal of x, and then we would have known 
that the reciprocal of one third is what x equals, or three. Uh, another thing that we need to talk about here is that notice this is a fractional equation. Anytime in solving fractional equations that we multiply both sides of the equation by a variable factor, we can introduce extraneous solutions. So when we get a solution of three, we have to make sure that we check back into this equation and that this three does not make this denominator equal to zero. Well, obviously if x is three, we get one over three, we do not have a denominator of zero, and it's pretty obvious that checks, because we have one-third equals one-third, don't we? So we have checked to make sure that this is not extraneous. Now, let's look at this equation. X to the minus one, and, and let's think about this. We know that X to the minus one is one over X, what we also know is that 1 over x equals 2. Since 1 over x is the reciprocal of x, we know that 2 is the reciprocal of x. Well, what number is 2 the reciprocal of? It's the reciprocal of 1 half. So what should our x equal? It should equal to 1 half. And if you understand this reciprocal relationship, then you know that x is one half. If you do not, then what you need to do is to rewrite the x to the minus one as its equivalent one over x, and then solve this equation. We'll solve this equation by getting rid of the x. We will find the LCD, which of course the two is understood to be over one, so we just simply need to say one times x is x. So our LCD for this equation is x. Let's multiply both sides of the equation by x. I think I'll put it on that side of the two. On the left, x divided by x is one. We're left with one times one or one. On the right, two times x is two x. Solving for x, we want to get it by itself since it's been multiplied by the two to get rid of the two we divide both sides by two, and sure enough, look what we get. One half equals x. So you can either understand this reciprocal relationship and write what x is equal to, or you can actually work this problem out. Now once again, if you work this problem out, since it's a fractional equation and you have multiplied both sides of the equation by a variable factor, you have to make sure that the one half is not extraneous. So go back up to this equation, replace this x with one half. If I do, I get one over one half. And the only thing I'm really checking for, one over one half if I work it out does equal to two, but what I'm really concerned about is if x is equal to one half, does this denominator equal to zero? And no, it doesn't, it equals one half. So neither of these solutions are extraneous solutions for their original equations. Now, um, there's another consideration here. They are not extraneous for their original equations, but, and I want to write these solutions. Let's see, let's write x equals three, x equals one half, and let's go back to this original equation. I want you to look at this original equation. We need, if we're going to check, we need to rewrite this original equation. We do not want these negative exponents. So how do we write three times x to the negative second power? Well now remember that the three is a factor and the x to the negative second power is a factor. That the negative two exponent only applies to the x. It does not apply to the three. So when I rewrite this term, I write the three in the numerator and the x to the negative second goes to the denominator as x to the positive two power. I can do that because x to the negative second is a factor of this term. Moving on to the second term, the seven stays in the numerator, the x to the negative one goes to the denominator as x 
to the first power. And then I'll have my plus 2 equals 0. When I consider these solutions, since this equation is a fractional equation, I need to make sure that neither of these solutions will make this de these denominators equal to 0. Well, of course, if I plug that 3 in, 3 squared is 9, not a problem. If I plug the 3 in here, I get a 3, not a problem. If I plug the 1 half in, 1 half squared would give me 1 fourth down here. It's not 0. If I plug the 1 half in here, I do not have 0 in the denominator. Now, um, these are the solutions for this equation. I would like to check one of them for you because I think you might have some difficulty there. Uh, let's check the 1 half. We'll have 3 over 1 half squared minus 7 over 1 half plus 2 does this equal to 0. Well, what is that 1 half squared? It's 1 fourth, isn't it? Now, we need to simplify these uh, complex fractions, don't we? This is 3 divided by 1 fourth, so that would be 3 times the reciprocal of 1 fourth, which would be 4. And for the second term, this is 7 divided by 1 half, so that would be 7 times the reciprocal of 1 half, which would be 2. 3 times 4 is 12, so we'll have 12 minus 7 times 2 is 14, plus 2. Does that equal to 0? Well, 12 minus 14 is a negative 2, and negative 2 plus 2 is 0. So sure enough, we have checked that x equals 1 half. I'll leave the check of x equals 3 to you. Okay, for this problem number 6, we have x to the 2 thirds power plus 4, x to the 1 third power plus 3 equals 0. Let's check this variable to see if we square this variable, if we'll get the variable in the first term. Let's take x to the 1 third. If we square it, we'll have x. And remember, when we take a power of a power, we multiply. What is 2 times 1 third? Well, if you need to, think 2 over 1. 1 times 2 over 3 times 1, x to the 2 thirds. So sure enough, if we take x to the 1 third and square it, we get x to the 2 thirds. So this is an equation in quadratic form. Let's rewrite it. Let's write this x to the 2 thirds as x to the 1 third squared plus 4 times x to the one-third plus 3 equals 0. And, and that way we can see very well that we have x to the one-third, and it's squared in the first term, and x to the one-third raised to the first power in that second term. Let's write our substitution. Our w will equal x to the one-third power. Let's substitute in place of x to the one-third, let's write our w, and of course it's squared, plus in the next term we'll have 4 times w plus 3 equals 0. We have a quadratic in the variable w. Let's factor. Let's use our zero product theorem. And let's solve each equation. Let's subtract 1. Let's subtract 3. We have our W solutions. Let's go up and relate them to our X. 
So if w equals x to the one-third and w equals negative one, then x to the one-third equals negative one and x to the one-third equals negative three. Now what we need to do is to solve these two equations, don't we? Well, what do we know x to the one-third is equal to? That's the cube root of x, isn't it? So let's go ahead and write that. Now, how do we solve an equation when we have the cube root of x equals negative 1? These are, once again, radical equations, aren't they? We isolate the radical, and then we'll cube both sides. So we've got the radical isolated. Let's cube both sides. We cube both sides because this is a cube root, right? And what is the cube root of x cubed? It's x, isn't it? And what is negative 1 cubed? It's negative 1. Now, whenever we raise both sides of an equation to an odd power, we don't have to worry about uh, this solution being extraneous. If you just want to check to be sure, uh, well, the cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. Likewise, for this equation, We'll cube both sides. We'll get x equals negative 27. And just a quick check, the cube root of negative 27 is negative 3. So our solutions for our original equation would be negative 1, negative 27, I thought maybe I'd check one of these for you. How about if I check negative 27? I don't think that negative 1 will be too difficult. Let's go ahead and write our solution set. And let's check. So we'll have negative 27 to the 2 thirds power plus 4 times negative 27 to the one-third power plus 3. Does that equal to 0? Well, we know we work those powers first, don't we? What does this mean, negative 27 to the two-thirds? Remember that we take the denominator and that becomes the root. That be the cube root of negative 27. And the numerator becomes the power of that cube root of negative 27. So let's rewrite this one too. Now what is the cube root of negative 27? It's negative 3, isn't it? So we've really got negative 3 squared plus 4 times negative 3 plus 3. Does that equal to 0? Well, what's negative 3 squared? We get 9. 4 times negative 3 would be minus 12 plus 3. 9 subtract 12 would be negative 3, and negative 3 plus 3 is 0. So you see that x equals negative 27 checks. Our solutions are negative 1 and negative 27, and you may check negative 1. Okay, look at this problem number seven. Do you notice something? That my variable part, x over x plus two, is squared in this first term, and it is understood to be to the first power in this second term, isn't it? So this is already in the form, variable part squared, and then the same variable to the first power. So I don't need to rewrite it. I just need to define what w should be, and what should w be here? That's right, this variable in the second term, which would be x over x plus 2. So let's rewrite this. We would have 6w squared minus 7 times w minus 3 equals 0. It's this equation is quadratic in W, 
Let's factor. Okay, let's use three, negative, and positive one. I think that'll give it to us. Let's use our zero product theorem. Let's solve. Let's subtract one from both sides. Let's divide by three. We get W equals negative one third. Let's add three to both sides. Let's divide by two. We get W equals three halves. These are our W solutions. We need to take them and relate them to our X. see what we'll get here. We'll get some new equations, won't we? Okay, w equals x over x plus 2, w equals negative 1 third. So we know that x over x plus 2 equals negative 1 third. And likewise, we know that x over x plus 2 equals three halves, replacing our w's with what they are equal to in terms of x. Now we need to solve both of these equations. I want us to make note of these equations. These are fractional equations, aren't they? And fractional equations uh, can have extraneous solutions, so we want to keep that in mind. Um, to solve this equation, since it's fractional, we need to find the LCD to get rid of the denominators. We have a factor of x plus 2 and a factor of 3. So we want to multiply both sides of the equation by 3 times x plus 2. Let's see here. Let's write this like this. multiplying. Okay, on the left, of course, the x plus 2 divided by x plus 2 is 1. We'll have 3 times x, or 3x. On the right, 3 divided by 3 is 1. And be very careful. We have a negative 1 that we need to distribute. Negative 1 times x is negative x. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. We have a linear equation. So we want to get the x's on the same side of the equation. Let's move this minus x by adding x to both sides. 3x plus x gives us 4x equals minus x plus x is 0x. So we're left with negative 2. Let's divide by 4. And then let's reduce. x equals negative. 2 goes into 2 once and into 4 twice. So we get x equals negative 1 half as the solution for this equation right here. Since this original equation is a fractional equation and we have multiplied both sides of the equation by a variable factor, we have to make sure that x equals negative 1 half is not an extraneous solution for this. Well, if we replace this x with negative 1 half, what do we get in this denominator? We would have negative 1 half plus 2. Is that equal to 0? Well, actually, it's equal to 3 halves, isn't it? So that's not 0. So x equals negative 1 half is not an extraneous solution of this equation. Let's solve this equation. It is also a fractional equation, 
we want to find its LCD so that we can get rid of the denominator. The LCD would be the factor 2 times the factor x plus 2. So let's multiply both sides of this equation by that LCD. We'll have 2 times x plus 2 times x over x plus 2 times, and let's, oh, not times, equals 3 halves times 2 times x plus 2. Now on the left, x plus 2 divided by x plus 2 is 1. We'll have 2 times x or 2x. On the right, 2 divided by 2 is 1. We'll have 3 times this x plus 2. Let's distribute 3 times x and then 3 times 2. Uh, let's, uh, this is linear. I think it might be quicker if we just move this 3x term since it's been added. We'll subtract it from both sides. 2x subtract 3x is minus x. On the right, 3x minus 3x is 0, so we're left with 6. Now, we know we don't solve for a negative, do we? So let's multiply both sides of this equation by negative 1. Negative 1 times negative x is positive x, and 6 times negative 1 is negative 6. First check, does negative 6 is negative 6 extraneous? Remember, we started out with a fractional equation, and we multiplied both sides of the equation by a variable factor. So the question is, does negative 6 make this denominator equal to 0? Well, let's just look at this denominator. It would be x plus 2. If x is negative 6, we'd have negative 6 plus 2, which is a negative 4. That's not 0. So x equals negative 6 is not extraneous. Now, if you will notice, and uh, let's uh, go ahead and write these two solutions. Let's see, x equals negative 1 half and x equals negative 6. And let's look at them in the original equation. Okay, if you will notice, we have variables in the denominator of the original equation, so we would need to make sure that these do not make these denominators equal to zero. But what is this expression? Isn't this x over x plus 2 the same expression that we were working with when we checked to see if either of these x values made these original denominators equal to zero? And we checked, here's where we checked the negative 6, and here's where we checked the uh, negative 1 half. And so since these x values didn't make this expression have a 0 in the denominator, since this expression is the same as this expression, we will not get zeros in the denominators in this original equation. Now, so we don't have to worry about zero denominators. These will be the solutions. Let's write this as a solution set. Now once again, I thought we might have some difficulty checking, so I thought I would check one. I'll leave the check of x equals negative 6 to you, but let's check x equals negative 1 half. I think in checking that it might be easier just to take this expression x over x plus 2 and figure out what number that's equal to when x equals negative 1 half, and then plug that into the original. So let's do that. I'd have a negative 1 half over negative 1 half plus 2. Well, of course, this negative 1 half, if I want to add it to 2, I want to write this uh, 2 over 1. The common denominator of 2 and 1 would be 2, so I need to multiply by 2 over 2. So I get that 2 over 1 is the same as 4 halves. Negative 1 half plus 4 halves would give me negative. Let's try that again. How about positive 3 halves? My de denominators are the same, so I'll say negative 1 plus 4 gives me positive 3. Now, this is a complex fraction, and negative divided by positive is a negative.
and then I need to take the numerator and multiply it by the reciprocal of the denominator, which would be two-thirds. Of course, in my multiplication, I can divide common factors. Two goes into two once, and two goes into two once. We'll have a negative one-third. So this expression, x over x plus two equals a negative one-third. So let's replace, we've got six times, since this is negative one-third, let's say negative one-third squared minus seven times negative one-third minus three. And the question is, on the check, does that equal to zero? Well, what is negative one-third squared? Let's go ahead and write that six over one because this is going to be a fraction and I'm going to have to multiply fractions. Well, of course, a negative squared is a positive and one-third times one-third is one-ninth. And let's write this 7 over 1 times the negative 1 third. Now, in this first multiplication, let's reduce. 3 goes into 6 twice and into 9 3 times. We'll have 2 times 1 over 1 times 3. In this second term, a negative times a negative is a positive. 7 times 1 over 1 times 3. Well, what is 2 thirds plus 7 thirds? It's 9 thirds, isn't it? What is 9 thirds? It's 3, isn't it? And sure enough, 3 minus 3 equals 0. So x equals negative 1 half checks. I'll leave the check of x equals negative 6 for you. And be sure that you Write the solutions for this equation in this solution set notation, negative one-half and negative six. Now I'd like for us to look at a list of the different types of equations that we have worked with in this lesson that we have found to be equations in quadratic form. I've written them in a generic form, and you might like to write this list down. Let's look at them. We began with ax to the fourth plus bx squared plus c equals zero. Of course, we realize that a, b, and c represent real numbers. a is the coefficient of x to the fourth, b is the coefficient of x squared, c is a constant. We know that for an equation to be in quadratic form, we need to be able to take the left side of the equation and set it equal to zero on the right side. We also know that a cannot equal to zero. We must have this first term. We must have a term that has a variable expression that has been squared. We may also have this middle term and the constant. For the problems that we worked, all of our problems did have all three of these terms. Also, for an equation to be in quadratic form, and probably most importantly, we need to be able to take the variable expression in this second term and square it to get the variable expression in this first term. And sure enough, x squared squared gives us x to the fourth. Another example of an equation in quadratic form would be ax plus b times the square root of x plus c equals zero. Let's look at the square root of x. When we took the square root of x and squared it, that gave us x, didn't it? We looked at ax to the negative second plus bx to the negative first plus c equals zero. If we take this x to the negative first power and square it, we get x to the negative second power. We worked problems with ax to the two-thirds plus bx to the one-third plus c equals zero. If we take x to the one-third and square it, we get x to the two-thirds. We also uh, worked a problem that had a binomial in parentheses. The problem that we worked had a variable, and then 
it had either plus or minus a constant. I just wrote this x minus 4 in. Of course, we could have any variable plus or minus a constant in these parentheses. What's important is that the expression in this parentheses is the same as the expression in this parentheses, and that in this middle term, the expression is raised to the first power, and in this first term, the expression is raised to the second power. And another version of that, a little more complicated uh, problem we worked, in parentheses we had a polynomial divided by a polynomial. It's very important that in both of these terms we have the same variable expression, and we do. Notice that, of course, in this second term, this variable expression is raised to the first power, and in the first term the variable expression is squared. So this was an example of an equation in quadratic form also. Um, of course, the equation would not have to have this exact variable expression. It's just that this variable expression should be the same as this variable expression. I hope these forms help you to identify equations that are in quadratic form. The first step to solving equations that are in quadratic form is to identify them as being equations in quadratic form. We need to take the variable expression in the middle term and square it and see that we get the variable expression in the first term. We then need to let w equal the variable expression in that middle term. We substitute w in to the original equation. That should give us a quadratic equation. We solve that quadratic equation for W. We take those solutions for W and we relate them to our variable expression X, which W equals. That should give us equations in the variable X. We have to use different methods for solving those equations in the variable X because we get different types of equations. Once we solve those equations in the variable x, then of course we always want to check our solutions. This completes the solving equations in quadratic form by substitution lesson. Please rewind the tape before you return it. Thank you.